so today we are really, really, um, uh, I think, blessed with, uh, with uh, Brian Kennedy, Joost Dan and Lynn Cox, who will uh, shine a little bit of a light on what kind of bottlenecks we have uh, in uh, research and academia at the moment uh, that um, would, be, uh, would be beneficial to solve. After we tackled industry in the last meeting, we're now moving on to academia and we'll be discussing a few other areas as well in the next few weeks. So I'm really, really happy to have uh, Brian Kennedy, Yostian and Lynn Cox here. Thank you so much for joining. I won't take any time further away from you guys. And Brian, if you perhaps want to start with a few areas of interest that you think are a good opportunity to make long-term risk in advancing um, research and academia. So I just put together a few slides and, and um, hang on a sec. And um, I think that uh, it's just really to illustrate the point that, you know, I think it's great that the, that the private sector has gotten into aging research, you know, five years ago or 10 years ago, especially, there really weren't companies in the space. There wasn't money to develop. Uh, uh, ideas uh, for, for widespread use and uh, that this change has been one of the revolutions that's happened to the field over the last decade. But I also think there's a perception that the basic research is, is, is something that's no longer needed. And, and I feel like that uh, that's uh, very unfortunate. And there, there are a lot of questions that, that can really be answered yet. I'll just mention a couple of them. And I just wanted to put this up first. I went back to my old slides. I found this from around 2006, you know, and um, this shows the three of the major pathways that we were studying with regard to aging uh, are three of the major genes at the time, TOR, S6 kinase and, and protein kinase A, which was also the RAS pathway in yeast. Um, and I didn't mention sirtuins, uh, uh, insulin IGF, we could have put those up. Uh, all of these pathways, or almost all of them, that are linked to aging that we're studying now came from invertebrate studies uh, of aging because these organisms age very quickly. Uh, at the time, with very little money, it was possible to do uh, studies where we could interrogate the whole genome to see which genes affect aging in a non-biased way. And we did that for yeast and, and found that almost 300 genes that regulate aging. Um, and, uh, and now these, these organisms are kind of going by the wayside in terms of funding and not rodents, but, but yeast and worms and flies. And, and I feel like that's a big mistake. Uh, uh, we need to keep doing this basic research and there's gonna be major discoveries that come out of that that are, that, uh, are not gonna be found out very easily if we don't. And to give you an example, you know, the, the as I said, 300 genes that regulate aging in yeast, we really don't know how they fit together into uh, genetic epistasis networks, uh, how they coordinate aging, which ones regulate the same pathways or different pathways. And a single celled organism like yeast may be the only way to easily answer that question. Um, and you know, about around 2013, uh, that there were two papers published, one that I was involved with on pillars of aging on the right, and one from Carlos Lopez Oten and colleagues on the left with hallmarks of aging. Uh, and they overlap a lot with each other, but both papers really emphasize the point of how all of these pathways are interconnected in a network. Uh, and that it was really the preservation of the network that underlies healthy aging. Uh, and uh, both of them tried to establish hierarchies uh, and I didn't put the one slide up from the hallmarks, but from the pillars, we basically said that everything was quite connected. And if you found an intervention like inhibition of TOR signaling, you could read that out as an improvement of all seven of these pillars. It wasn't as if only one pathway was being targeted uh, and that was leading to aging. And so we still say that. And, and you know, when, when I say that, a lot of people nod their heads, but I don't think we understand biologically what this network means yet and how it's regulated. And if, you know, we say like towards at the node of a network, but I don't know that anyone can really explain that at a level that uh, we can understand from a, from a conceptual point of view. So that's another example where there's really open questions that are not being addressed in the aging field. You know, in, in the meantime, we've gone to all these different kinds of interventions. There are lifestyle interventions in the middle in red drugs and small molecules that 
that I'm working on and many other labs are working on and even more exotic things, gene therapy, stem cell therapy, uh, and a range of other things that are being conceptualized at the moment. And all that's great. And some of that can be funded by private sector, although some of this more uh, stuff that's out there at the moment uh, that may have bigger effects on aging in the long term, but it's not really ready for prime time in terms of private sector development, that stuff is hard to fund as well too. So uh, that sort of blue space, how do we really change the aging paradigm, I think is, is a challenge. Uh, I listed all these small molecules we work on and a lot of these were funded, are now funded by companies and, the, uh, and I mentioned some of them here. Uh, but a lot of them aren't, and we're still doing discovery phase of small molecules, of, and so that's something that needs to be done. But the main thing I want to focus on is how do we get human with these interventions, and that means validating the effects of small molecules. Uh, how do we understand aging from a personalized level, and how do we find the interventions that scale to really impact humanity? Now, private sector, the challenge here is that they uh, pick their molecules or their biomarkers of aging. Uh, and uh, that's great. I, again, I work with a number of these companies, but it, they're, they're sort of more general questions that I think needs to be answered. And one is how do we validate longevity intervention? So uh, for instance, if you, a number of the companies that are being invest, invested in, in the aging space are really targeting disease. And so that would fall into this top category where you have an intervention that uh, looks good because it targets a longevity pathway, but then you try to find a disease indication to treat because that's the way to get something approved by the FDA and to get reimbursed by the drug industry. Um, uh, by the way, I'm not really weighing in one way or another on these strategies, I'm just pointing them out. So this is what companies are often doing at the moment. Uh, and then there's more, uh, more direct aging studies. And so this would be this one in the middle would be a health span study with, uh, for instance, the TAME study with metformin, where you're trying to prevent multiple kinds of chronic diseases in people that are still relatively healthy by preserving their health span. Um, they're expensive long-term studies, but it could be highly valuable. Uh, and then there are aging biomarker studies, which is what we're focusing on, uh, which are shorter term six month studies um, using biomarkers that really are, I think are not fully validated yet, but we tend to believe in them. So uh, like one of the things we're doing in my lab now is trying to recalibrate how we do mouse studies so that they're aligned with these shorter term biomarker studies in humans and so that we can work back and forth more easily. Um, if, just to give you an, an idea how these studies are being done, this is one sponsored by a company uh, for the uh, alpha ketoglutarate that I've talked about a lot. And this is one done by our lab. So focus on this bottom one because it's academic. Uh, there we're looking at just the sustained release. We're taking 45 to 65 year olds doing six month interventions and using aging biomarkers as outcomes. Now, it's hard to get companies generally to fund this at the moment. Uh, this, is, this works for this company because it's a natural product. But for drugs, it's not easy to do this because there's no indication that really can be reimbursed by it. So a company struggles with this still. And so what we're trying to do is test is up to 10 of these small molecules in these small studies so that we can compare and contrast how different interventions affect aging. And I think that's important because um, if, you're, if everybody's just testing one in their own context, we don't know which ones work best in which people under which context. Uh, and so by testing multiple ones at the same site, we can start to compare uh, what's likely to work where. And so we're using a number of different biomarkers. I won't spend time on this slide. Um, that, and, and this is another challenge though, is that one biomarker is, is often used for outcomes in studies. And we don't know how these aging-based biomarkers interact with each other yet. This is the one you probably all heard of, which is DNA meth methylation clock. But even there, there's about 10 different methylation clocks that are available. Uh, and so from an academic perspective, we can take a more holistic approach and use multiple biomarkers of aging and multiple interventions and align those. Uh, and so th those are the kinds of things that I think need, need to be done because we have to validate what works in humans. And some of that can be done from a private sector side, but 
there are other also advantages to doing that on the academic side. So I'll just stop. Uh, but this is our healthy webinar series, shameless plug. Uh, you can go there and uh, hear uh, discussions by a variety of speakers in the aging field, a couple of which I noticed are on the call and a couple of others I'm going to reach out to. So I'm doing this at three in the morning. So if you're listening to me now, you have to say yes when I ask you to do the webinar series. Uh, and so that's all I have. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much, uh, Brian, for this fantastic overview. Um, yeah, I think definitely, uh, there was a lot there. Um, unless, uh, are there any questions or comments from anyone in the group? Feel free to raise your hand. Um, I would be curious if you, you know, let's say, what, what kind of concrete effort could a new project take on in this space? Because this seems something that, uh, you know, uh, projects that are already up and running, you know, should just be doing uh, more of. But is there a, a particular, let's say, like call to action that you want to uh, put out? Well, again, I think that the, I just want to reemphasize the need for basic science. That that um, the 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 key discoveries that led to this field, none of which could have been funded by the private sector at the time, and there are many more key discoveries that can be made. Some of which will be surprising, I think, and change how we think about aging. Uh, and it's hard to I think it's hard to point. The advantage of academic research is that you're, you, you're not pointing in one direction, you know, and that you're trying to take people with good ideas and invest in them and the discoveries they make uh, will be surprising and sometimes they're not even directed at aging and they lead to uh, key understanding about aging. I think that's one of the reasons we fail in academically when we say we're going to put $100 million at Alzheimer's disease because in reality, the, the discovery that leads to the breakthrough on Alzheimer's disease may be somebody working in biophysics asking some question completely that they didn't even know was related to Alzheimer's disease. And so uh, academic science works by funding, you know, smart people with good ideas and then letting serendipity take it run its course. So, but we're not really doing as much of that anymore. And, and things are becoming heavily focused on translation, even from NIH and other great government funding agencies. And I think there's a risk that we're going to lose long-term discoveries that could have even more value by doing that. Thank you so much. OK, we have one question from Carl here. So I just want to say, Brian, I completely agree with you that the private sector explosion does not at all mean that the you know, fundamental academic work is less important. Um, I think that the right analogy to point to when you talk about this is the is what happened with computer science, um, where lots of government funding of fundamental academic work created the infrastructure to enable the commercial explosion that happened in the 90s and created the World Wide Web and, you know, and the bubble, the dot com bubble. And then even though there was a, a bubble and a crash, obviously the, the tech sector has, has changed the world and that's what we think the longevity sector is gonna do. And in fact, the commercial explosion directly led to a massive push of people going into the academic field in that area. And I think that's going to happen here and that's what we wanna have happen. And that will yeah. lead to more funding and more smart minds working in this area in the academic sector. Yeah, I, I hope that's the case too. All right, uh, Robert, uh, did you want to ask your question? Uh, sure. So uh, just wondering, what, what is the lowest hanging fruit, in your opinion, for something like what the Foresight Longevity Accelerator here is looking to do later this year? Well, uh, you know, again, I, I think it's trying to understand what we mean when we say network regulating aging, you know, and uh, how, do we, how do we directly find out when you modulate a certain pathway, like the TOR pathway or sirtuins or pick, take your pick, how do we directly assign the, the primary roles of this pathway in modulating aging? How do we, if it's really just preserving the network, what does that mean from a biologic perspective? And, and I, I have a hard time understanding that. And I think that I haven't seen anywhere in the literature really begin to describe that yet. We know lots of interventions uh, and we have lots of papers about that, like this intervention does A and it does B, and it affects inflammation, it affects stem cells, but what are the primary effects of this intervention and how does that get translated into a preservation of a network? That would be a question that I, I, I struggle to answer. Thank you. 
All right, we have one more by Chris Carlson and then we're moving on to Lynn. Well, Brian, um, I do a lot of simulations, so I, I resonate with what you said about understanding simpler systems before you go to complex. I always want to understand uh, y equals mx plus b before I look at a Bessel function. Um, has anyone, I'm a little out of touch with all this, has anyone removed, you know, tried removing the extra chromosomal RDNA circles that uh, cause death in yeast? Yeah, uh, that can be done. And there is a modest effect on lifespan. Uh, so you get yeast that live longer, uh, but it doesn't like make immortal yeast. And, and, and in fact, What kills quick, them then? Good, good question. And in fact, the, you know, I think that when you look at replicative aging in yeast, that's the number of times the mother cell divides. And that's how I got into this field in Lenny Garanti's lab like seven, seven you know, lifetimes ago. The, uh, the, um, what you see is that uh, you have the cells divide about 25 times and you knock out all the genes and then you start combining the long lived knockouts. And what happens is you get to 45 generations and you hit a new barrier. Okay, and presumably the reason you don't have nothing affects that barrier is because when the cells were only dividing 25 times, that 45 barrier was irrelevant. If you could have knocked out that barrier, but it didn't matter because the cells were dividing for a reason, the first set of reasons. Uh, and so we have no idea what that second barrier is in yeast. And I suspect there are going to be barriers like that in, in humans as well. And if we're lucky enough to get past the first set of limitations, we're going to run into a second set that we may not understand at all at this point. So um, that's another place I think yeast could be valuable is, you know, how there, there, there are going to be waves of limitations. It's not like if we just solve these first problems, we're going to get in. Sure. I don't think that's going to lead to immortality. So. Uh, so I, I'd about, like to. Uh, can I just uh, one quick follow? So Cindy Kenyon told me the worms choke to death. Has anyone tried to? address that they choke to death yeah the the uh you know the nerves that that go to the uh oh they're, they eat they're bacteria and, and they can't yeah yeah exactly. i mean yeah i mean i i think it's it's still in my opinion an open question what the cause of death is in, in a number of these organisms and and, it, and how it changes when you perturb the system and extend lifespan Okay. Oh, we had a little intervention before we move on. <clears throat> One of the best things that ever happened to me was about 17 years ago when the University of Cambridge decided not to give me a proper job. And the reason, that, and the reason they didn't was because I said what I thought would be the answer to exactly what Brian just raised, the um, succession of new problems that might arise during human aging if we succeed in extending health span and lifespan. I said, we're going to be doing far more primate research again. The whole trend to limit primate research is going to go into reverse. And they didn't like that. It was politically incorrect. And just getting a nod. All right, well, Brian, <laughs> we're gonna let you go into the chat. Thank you really, I think from everyone uh, for, for getting up uh, at this incredible hour. And thank you so, so much for your presentation. It was really, really like a wonderful overview. And every, anyone who uh, Brian is asking now in the chat to uh, be featured in his longevity series, you have to say yes, just a reminder. <laughs> thank you so much, Thanks Brian. I'm gonna take off, yeah, thanks. Hi. Um, yeah. All right, next one up, we have Lynn. Lynn, welcome. I'm gonna share more info about you here in the chat. Thank you so, so much for being willing to present. My pleasure. I'm just gonna try and share my screen now. Um, let's hope that works. You can see stuff, I hope. <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, right, well, I mean, it's it's a very hard act to follow Brian, so I'm going to go in a slightly different direction. Um, obviously, our task is to look at underexplored ideas in academic research and where we can go. And of course, we already have quite a lot of well-explored ideas. Um, so Aubrey's Seven Deadly Things and the Hallmarks of Aging that Brian was just talking about, but we do need more of this. And it's exactly what he was saying. We need the basic research to tie everything together. 
um, I'm a basic molecular cell biologist. I have a very strong interest in cell senescence. But what I was thinking yeah. of doing today is instead of going to the stuff that we already think we know quite a lot about, we don't know enough about, but we know quite a lot about it, is to try and look at things where we simply don't know enough at all and um, the opportunities that those things offer. So I was going to look um, briefly at new approaches to drug discovery for aging and how that interacts with in silico modeling of aging biology. So, so the synergism between getting a decent model, Brian talked about epistatic, epistatic effects, network interactions and things like that. And that is absolutely crucial to understanding how to develop new drugs. So, um, Again, I mean, Brian said all this already, but aging isn't easy. It's a complex system. It, it's um, an emergent biological system. So things change, emerge out of the system over time. And you have really, really uh, complicated intertwined networks with some key nodes, but they all talk to each other all of the time. And traditionally, uh, pharma has uh, gone through the model of one target, one drug. I don't know, my computer's overtaken me on this, sorry. Um, one target, one drug, where you know exactly what you're, you're aiming to develop a drug against, and you develop that drug to essentially kill the thing. Um, so you try and completely ablate a pathogen, you use antibiotics to kill bacteria, or if you've got a driver mutation, gain of function driver mutation in a cancer, you will try and completely block the function of that particular um, well, BCR able kinase. Um, or more subtle approaches now like restoring loss of function, but historically it's always been one drug, one target. Now in aging, what we know is the interconnectedness of all of this stuff and redundancy within those pathways. If you take out one node of a pathway, you're gonna have another pathway kick in, or if you completely ablate a pathway, then you might mess up the whole of the network. And we can think of these interconnected nodes in a sort of mechanical way. So mimicking them with a, an old fashioned pocket watch where each of the cogs and each of those little uh, parts of the cog and, and everything interacts. And you need every single component of these to work properly together in order to get a functional system. And so my view of pharma is they've taken the back off the watch and they're trying to fix one particular cog that may have gone sort of slightly out of kilter. But what happens is you take a hammer to it and you completely smash that cog. And of course, if you're trying to do this in a living biological human cell, the impact of that might be to mess up the whole of the rest of the system. So um, I have concerns about this inhibition, total inhibition approach. And what I think we might need to do is take a much more nuanced approach, fine tuning, retuning a delicate system and essentially restoring homeostasis. So aging as a loss of homeostasis, maybe we need to just gently tweak that watch mechanism and get everything ticking over properly again. Um, so an approach that avoids this pharma issue of one drug one target. Um, we need to be thinking in terms of damping down different nodes of a complex internet in interconnected network rather than specifically killing one individual node. And that does require systems biology thinking and it requires the type of stuff that Brian was talking about, um, all those genetic screens in yeast where we identify sorry, computer playing up, um, identify individual components that talk to other components and work out how they all work. And one way of doing systems biology and drug discovery is, is, is to think in terms of drug synergy. So developing polypharmacology where we have one agent that might be able to modulate multiple nodes all at the same time. Uh, and in doing this, we don't need to know what the target is. We can go in completely agnostic to target as long as we know what the function is that we want to correct. And the function is essentially restoring a normal homeostatic phenotype um, so if we go into function first phenotypic drug screening um, and so um, at the moment we know that aging um, results in multimorbidity and multiple diseases of aging and currently they're all treated in different clinics by different clinicians with different drugs and we end up with polypharmacy where older people have 10 15 even 20 different drugs rattling around and them all interacting with each other and potentially in harmful ways and what we need instead is to look at central core shared processes like the aging process in cluster diseases where we can hit the core of it all and there's an opportunity for discovery here of polypharmacology 
uh, polypharmacologically acting agents, things that can hit multiple different components all at once. Now, in order to do that, we, we need a sort of different way of understanding things. So this is probably a bit out of the box, but I think we can radically re-understand the way we look at biology and take lessons from Silicon Valley, where we have two problems. Uh, oops, We've got a hardware issue and we have a software issue. And we don't actually know whether aging is a problem with the hardware. We're pretty sure that at least some of it is. We, we can see problems with the hardware, but we think there's also problems with the software. And when we're talking hardware in biology, we can be quite reductionist and we can say the hardware is essentially a cell, it's the nuts and bolts, the organelles, the macromolecules, and the software is the way that those bits talk to each other. It's the information flowing through the system in these biochemical pathways. And so if we can think of biochemistry as a computational problem, then maybe as we accumulate more biochemical data, we can plug it into <clears throat> a program and we can start to run these programs and mimic um, aging in silico. So for example, we've been working on mTOR, it's something that Brian obviously is also working on a lot. And we already know quite a lot about the signaling pathways, mTOR as hubs and nodes, taking in information from outside the cell, integrating that information and coming up with a solution. And we also know that this pathway is normally incredibly well regulated in young cells, but it's constitutively switched on in old cells. So we can start to model this in a computational way where we can think in terms of the inputs coming through logic gates. So mTOR responds to nutrients and, and cytokines, and those will come through an OR gate. Um, it will also respond to low energy and stress by not being switched on, so that's an OR gate. And it integrates those two, sig two sets of signals and decides whether or not to push a cell through the proliferative pathway. And in this case, where there is stress, but nutrients, um, it will not signal for proliferation. But in an old cell, that programming has gone wrong. So instead of mTOR um, taking two inputs and, and deciding, it acts as an OR gate and it'll just, it, it only needs one of those inputs before it decides to activate. And so this essentially is a bug in the software that happens in senescent cells. And so all we need to do is go back in there and debug the software. So as a proof of concept, we've been trying to do this and mTOR comes in um, different forms. So there's mTORC1 and mTORC2. Most people will be familiar with the drug rapamycin, which predominantly hits mTORC1. But we've been working with a pan mTOR inhibitor that, that hits both mTORC1 and 2 to see if we can actually modulate and reprogram, debug that piece of software. And essentially, if we treat old senescent cells with a pan mTOR inhibitor, we can actually restore their proliferative capacity. We can restore all their metabolic functions. But oddly enough, unlike a Silicon uh, Valley solution, resetting the software in this case also resets the hardware. So this is a very simplistic example of how you can just model a couple of components of a biochemical pathway in an in silico way. And that might lend um, to a, a new approach to developing poly, polypharmacological drugs by using um, phenotypic screening and then by developing an in silico aging cell. And of course, the complexity of aging means that developing an in silico aging human is going to be quite tough. But I mean, if, if people can write programs for Call of Duty, maybe they can write programs for the in silico aging human. Um, what we know we don't know about the complexity is how all these things interact. So how genes interact with each other, how the uh, chemicals and um, components of the cell interact with tissues, organs and systems, how our microbiome talks to all of that. And then even more complicated layers on top, how our exposure to environmental factors impacts epigenetically, both within our own cell generations, but also intergenerationally between people. And so what we need, and again, this is something that Brian has touched on, um, biomarkers. We really need to know what's going on. We need a full biochemical uh, workup. You can't design an in silico aging cell if you don't understand the biochemistry of the pathways that you're modeling. And then we need some really clever people who can do systems modeling, but we also need big, big data. So not just bio biology omics big data, but we need to incorporate data coming in from the socioeconomic side of aging. And so Tina Woods, I see, is on the call and, and she's been instrumental in setting up something called the Open Health Data Project. So I think if we can finally bring together all the different communities, so the academic communities work in biology, socioeconomic health, um, 
computer programming, all these sorts of things, and perhaps we can finally come up with a way of doing something really different, but, but, but quite a, a game changer in this field. So I'll stop sharing at that point. I hope that wasn't too crazy. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot for that uh, presentation. A lot, again, a lot was in there. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah. I had a comment from Nir in the chat. Would you like to make that um, publicly? Oh, oh no, I, I, I didn't really mean to make it public. I, just that we had, we had um, you know, I, I, I would just say, look, uh, we started calling it Jeromics. Jeromics sounds maybe like a Western, like Jeronomic, you know, but using omics for uh, gerontology and we're all facing this challenge and we are all coming with this approach and i just gave another paper that kind of says what lynn said uh, in other words uh, lynn i i love the software uh, hardware uh, <laughs> slides of yours <laughs> uh, but th thank you that was that was terrific that that's all i just wanted another reference there okay thanks Neil. Awesome, thank you. Um, Robert, would you like to go? And if anyone else has a question, please say so in the chat or just raise your hand. Uh, sure, just a quick question. So what, in your view, are the best available in silico models applicable to what you were just talking about right now? Um, there are a few online models of the in silico cell, but essentially, I don't think they're based on enough biochemical data to make any sense um so um god i should have this off the top of my head and i'm sorry it's late in the uk as well um there, there's one based in germany that that's pretty good um but it, it can't model the complexities that we know exist and the problem at the moment is that you can put in a single factor and you can read out maybe two or three factors and what i'm saying is that what you need to do is be able to change one tiny component like phosphorylation of one particular factor in the signaling pathway and read out everything all the way across and i simply don't think those that level of complexity exists in any of the programs we've got um, so it, it's not entirely novel people are trying to do the in silico modeling there was a group in newcastle also trying to do this um, but it's just simply that the quality of the material used to set up the programming at the moment I don't think is there. So if anybody else on the call has a much better idea, I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to, uh, to yield the floor on that. So if anyone's come up with a virtual cell that actually works, I'd be delighted to hear it. <laughs> so sorry, Robert, I don't actually have an, an answer to that. No, thanks. That's uh, essentially what I want to know. All right, lovely. Are there any questions, comments I may be missing? I have a question. Are there areas where you think uh, systems pharmacology is uh, limited by tools, uh, either for characterization or experimental intervention? Because I think that's obviously one way in, in which uh, science makes progress, that is, basic scientists say this is a known unknown this is something we yeah. would like to be able to measure uh, or a way that we would like to experimentally intervene we can't do it uh, and then ask people in the physical sciences and engineering can you develop a tool or a methodology that would have this set of performance characteristics that's really quite cool. Um, can I give you two answers? One is a tool that isn't the pharmacology side of things, but it's actually a generation of new chemical space type of tool. Mm -hmm. um, so at the moment, a lot of the stuff that we're looking at is natural product libraries or the general chemical libraries. But what we think you might need in order to have polypharmacological effect is, is to join to, uh, to have um, uh, combinatorial libraries made of drug-like fragments and we need tools in order to generate those so um, I mean I've, I've got a brilliant postdoc in my lab who's looking at doing that through a directed evolution program um, so it's essentially trying to generate new chemical space using a tool um, that, that is agnostic in, in the way you develop it but the readout is simply do you have a phenotypic change 
based on the activity of the products that that particular component has managed to generate. Um, so that's one type of tool at the very top of the tree. Can we make new chemicals, new drug-like molecules that will have impact? And then in terms of the readouts at the other end, because the readouts are so complex and we want to be target agnostic, I think the readout ought to be, um, the target should be, say, a senescent cell, and the readout should be, can we make the cell senescent cell not senescent anymore? Or as a consortium of, of C. elegans people has been doing, can we take an old worm and make it not old again using drug treatment? So the Buck Institute obviously has been doing a lot of that type of screening. So in terms of tools that um, the community can bring to bear, um, imaging tools and things like that, we might need to know a target if we're going to specify. Um, we want you to look at the, the relocalization of a particular protein in, um, in the context of drug treatment. But to me, actually, I don't need that level of detail if I want to find if a drug's effective. I want to have a complete phenotypic change. Does, does that make any sense at all? <laughs> okay, thanks, Tom. Right, I think now we have a comment from you. Can I, can I, um, can I, can I say something, Tom? You've been asking this question every time we've met, and I, I appreciate that. And I, yes, I learn a lot because if we want to, you know, be out there, we should, we should move the technology, right? And the reality for us is that we actually believe and think that aging is much easier to crack than cancer or the brain. Um, uh, and that they have paved the road for a lot of the technology we're, we're using. Look, when you have, if you have cancer, you have a whole new genome on your body that is different than yours. It's only not only one genome, it's probably several genomes. And they're different even from every cancer in the world. Cancer, cancer is really a, a mess to tackle. And we think that aging is much simpler than that, at, at least for now. So I, I think that's the reality. And we really have to think hard of what others are not paving that will pay for us. But the technologies that everybody else is uh, using is probably good for us too, largely. <laughs> Lovely. Um, I, I, I do see another you there from Lynn too. Yeah, thank you uh, for, for the uh, general comment here, yeah, I think. <laughs> and, and Tom, keep, keep on asking their questions. Um, all right, lovely. Thank you, everyone. Um, now we have uh, our final contribution uh, to the question, what kind of research opportunities may we be missing right now? Uh, Joris, thank you so, so much for joining again. You joined, I think, uh, quite early on last year uh, in, in our meetings. And I'm really, really happy that, uh, that you found time to join again. You also completed the health extension challenge uh, on the Google Doc that I shared. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm super excited for what you're going to share with the group, and I'll share your bio in the chat. Yeah, so I didn't prepare a presentation, but I just want to tell a bit more about the direction that I'm going into and that I think is important. And it's actually two things that I want to talk about. The first is about uh, biomarkers and how to better get them into the clinic. And the second is how we can use the genetics of long-lived people to actually find out better targets that we should pharmacologically inhibit. Um, so starting with the biomarker. So what I realized when I was working still in Leiden in the group of Aileen Slagboom, so really in the clinic, that not many things that are actually coming from the model organisms are used in the clinic. So people are trying to do all these kind of intervention studies and they develop compounds and, and want, want to use them. But actually, there is another issue that's coming before that. That's, that's for example, that we identified already very nice biomarkers in, in many different studies, even in humans, but they are not used by the clinicians themselves when they treat the patients. So one of the things that I definitely think deserves attention and that I'm working on also in Cologne is trying to use all the biomarkers that are already out there, test them in, in really clinical populations to see if they are really good biomarkers in these people, combine them with currently existing things that are used in the clinic. For example, people are still measuring your cholesterol and your triglycerides, but are already much better markers available that say something about your health. So my main, one of my main goals is to, to bring some of these things also that I identified myself, like this metabolomic biomarkers into the clinical setting and see if we can actually replace the things that are currently used there. 
and also bring the things that are found in the animal models to the clinic because that's an even step that's even bigger because uh, I work also with the people in the Max Planck and I identified very nice biomarkers, but there it kind of stops. So they identified in, in say worm or a mouse and then it stops. And I actually want to improve the, the process by which they actually show more evidence in the animal model so that it can be brought to the human. And one of the things that I think is important, for example, is if you take a human and you look at it in the clinic, what are you normally doing? You're taking blood and you do some physical test but what are doing people doing with animal models they all take all kinds of tissues and test all kinds of things but they don't take the blood or the blood is the best translational thing between the two species so i think for example we should focus more on uh, testing things in the blood of mice or actually saying okay if we have an intervention that works on the mice what does it do with the blood can we then also see the same similar things in humans that undergo similar kind of intervention so we need to harmonize this better and also like Brian said, and I think it was, was very good that he also tries to create mouse studies that mimic the human situation. I think that is also very important that the mouse studies become more like human studies so that hopefully findings are more translatable. Um, so for me, that's one of the, the, the main challenges that I'm working on to really get things that are already discovered. It's not novel discovery all the time, but that are already out there. For example, the epigenetic clocks and the biomarkers that we identify and bring them actually in the clinic to the clinic to a population where they could be relevant. Um, and then the second part that I'm working on a lot is on the genetics. So what I see is that uh, a lot of research that is basic research is coming from the animal models and which works very well. We identified very nice, some common pathways like incident signaling that seems to be very relevant for the humans. However, we sometimes uh, do not see the same effects in the humans. And actually in the humans, when we look, for example, at the genetics, it's really hard to find the, the, the shared genetic mechanisms between all these people that explain why they are becoming so old. So I think we should also work on this. So I recently wrote a review about this where I, I explained how I think we could better um, use this the data from these long-lived individuals to test this in the animal models. So instead of coming from the, anim from the animal models to humans, we should go from the humans and the long-lived people and try to mimic these effects in the animal models. And if we then know what these mechanisms are, we should try to develop uh, pharmacological interventions that mimic these effects. So because then we know that these are effects that are actually observed in humans. Take, for example, rapamycin. Um, if you just give full rapamycin to an individual, it blocks completely um, mTOR1. However, in, in, in long-lived humans, we normally do not see that. We don't see the complete blockage. We see much milder effects. So it might be good to use this data that we have in the humans and see kind of how we should, um, should target these different mechanisms in a way that is more natural so that hopefully also the drugs um, will translate better to the humans. So that were actually the two main points uh, I want to bring up and that, that's what I'm working on in my group. And I'm really interested to hear how you feel about this, if you have, if you agree, disagree and, um, and, and open discussion. I, I'm, I'm more for an open discussion than really presenting something. Thank you, lovely, thank you so much. Um, are there any immediate questions or comments? Uh, otherwise, I'll just start with one. I think that, you know, Robert, uh, started with uh, with Brian as well. What would be um, kind of like a project that uh, could tackle this kind of um, uh, this endeavor? Because it seems like you know, maybe like a database in which pe different people uh, would share their experiences, so they can get uh, re retranslated between the different experiments. I don't know. What What do you think? Well, one of the things, for example, is that it, I, I would be interested to kind of collect all kind of biomarkers together and test them in one study. I think if we if we can get that um, done, I would already be very happy. I mean. This is one of the, if you take the epigenetic clock and the thing that we are we have generated they have never been tested in the same study and not in the right study so yeah what i so that would be a kind of if you have a really good database where everybody agrees on okay these are the biomarkers that we are now trusting and that people should be testing and then use these and that people then start using all these kind of um markers as much as possible in their studies. And I know this is, is a, a big challenge because some of these markers are very costly. Um, so one of the things I didn't mention yet, and I think we should also work on is trying to develop markers that are less costly and, and much easier to, to, um, 
to measure in humans. Like for example, if you take the epigenetic age, uh, it costs you a couple of hundred euros per sample. If you then have a big study, it's going to be expensive. And I think we want to come up with markers that are a bit cheaper, like the triglyceride measure in the, in the clinic is quite cheap, um, that we can then use. And then also it would be more interesting for, for, for example, doctors to actually use these kind of, of markers. So coming up with a good database of markers where there is agreement between researchers that we think they are good markers would be also a very good starting point. And I don't think such a database is actually there at the moment. Well, we will uh, discuss um, particularly biomarker standardization uh, as well in uh, later meetings. But um, if people here already know of a few um, that like of their current favorite um, efforts, that would be useful to know. Can I raise a very quick thing in terms of biomarkers in response to what you were just saying there. Um, there's a new paper out in Nature Communications about diagnosing Parkinson's disease on the basis of um, lipids in sebum. So different compositions of ceramides and things like that. And of course, that is an incredibly cheap, easy way of doing it. And it was based on one nurse's ability to smell Parkinson's patients. And so they did some mass spec of, of the secreted components in sebum. So I think when we've been looking at biomarkers, we've been looking in a very limited way at what we think of biomarkers. And we've just got to be a bit more adventurous about the types of things that we consider as a biomarker. Yeah, I completely agree. I think we, we are limiting ourselves mostly to, to measuring things that, that are in the body, but ignore these kind of things that you are just mentioning. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Yeah. Lovely. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, all right, so uh, let's say if you had a specific uh, um, topic, uh, if you had a specific project that was particularly uh, focusing on, oh, well, we had uh, Joe, Joe Betts, do you wanna make your comment? He asked about uh, skin biopsy. Yeah, so the question is- so, so I'm, I'm just in, in a, a non-ideal environment, but um, yeah, so uh, you know, collecting, collecting samples from humans is hard uh, unless it's blood. Uh, uh, but you know, that's a very a narrow window on what's going on in, in the body because blood cells are kind of weird. Uh, and I was, <clears throat> so I was just kind of reaching for, is there some other, Sort of non-blood anchor that it's not too hard to get from people and i know that's like skin punch biopsies are unpleasant but not that bad it's not like taking a, a tissue sample from the brain or something um is, is that prevalent do you think it's practical is there some other thought of how you could expand beyond blood it's it's definitely i mean we are also doing it skin biopsies can be taken quite quite easily i would say um the, the challenge there is to to make it into something where you can actually test something on. So normally you would bring it, for example, in cell culture and start testing there. And there you run into the limitation that you cannot test a lot of samples at the same time, which is the advantage of blood. You just take it and you, you can do high throughput measurements quite easily. And there are not many, I mean, you can also take um, uh, saliva, for example, which, which has similar properties, but there are not many other tissues that are easily taken from humans where you can do high throughput uh, measurements on so that you can actually do it in thousands of individuals at the same time, which would also be needed. I mean, if we want to bring, what some people sometimes forget is when we want to bring something really into the clinic, it needs to be high throughput and it needs to be easily measurable. And a lot of focus now is on discovering the biomarkers, but there's not so much work yet on further developing them into something that can be measured high throughput um, and and is and and cheap, and I think that is also a challenge that um, that we should be working on. I mean, we have used, for example, this this metabolomics platform, um, where we were really happy with because for thirty euros per sample we could measure uh, and they could measure thousands of samples at once. They are also measuring the whole UK biobank. And it, it was really standardized and everything. So we could directly compare it between different studies. And these are the things that we are looking for because that's what we would need in the clinic. 
Doris, can I ask whether you've um, looked at urine because we were contemplating it in a bunch of patients urine, yeah. and obviously there's a volume issue so you have to spin it all down, but there's a lot of cells come out in urine. Um, people tend to think of it as a sterile fluid, acellular, but it's not. There's a lot of biological material there with components that can be measured. And of course, that's something that people aren't particularly worried about giving away. Um, so is it something that might be useful to start looking for particular biomarkers in? Yeah, that's actually a good point. I forgot to mention urine is indeed also a good, uh, good fluid. And that's actually what, what we are also doing. So for example, with, with the metabolomics platform, it can also be done on urine. You get less markers because there's less uh, present there, but it can also be used to, um, to identify biomarkers. So also one of my next plans is to use urine and blood from the same individuals and then test indeed um, how well they correlate with each other when we when we measure specific biomarkers. But yes, it can definitely be used also to, to measure something. It's less, you can measure less than in blood, but still it's a, it's a nice fluid to, um, to use and it's easy to obtain. And I mean, the same with stool. We, it, it's also possible to obtain that um, in, in a less, in a non-invasive way, but people are not so confident normally to provide it. Um, but yeah, I mean, there we can also say something about the microbiome when we, when we have stool and things like this. So there are ways um, that we can also use other tissues, um, but blood is still at the moment the thing that people always kind of take. But I think maybe we should also work in this clinical studies on collecting this other kind of tissue so that we, we can see if these provide additional information that's not provided in the blood. Thank you. Um... I don't know. I saw Carl uh, putting his um, foot on. I don't know if that means he wants to make a comment or not. No. <laughs> I have a question that's more for Nier, but and the you know in response to your, does anybody want to throw out any any other crazy things? Um, so Nier, let's take the you know pessimistic view and assume the field is going to be unsuccessful for the next couple decades, but that the study of supercentenarians is super important you know, in, in two decades or more, there are going to be a lot more supercentenarians. Um, what should sort of government funded academic research be doing now with the people who are in their like 90s or 80s to start tracking in terms of that will give us better, you know, what do you wish you could have done 20, 30 years ago with the batch that you have now that, you know, if we start now, we can get governments to help ensure that, you know, whoever replaces you in, in a generation, or maybe you, if you're still going, because metformin works so well, you know, what do you want to have happen so that 20 years from now, the, the larger batch of super centenarians have, you know, we have better data on them. That's a terrific uh, question. Do you know that I'm a hundred years old, actually? <laughs> I, I don't know if it shows. Um, but um, it, it's interesting that you say that because, you know, the pharmaceutical Regeneron, and, and that's not the only one, but the pharmaceutical Regeneron, they say, hey, if we had a, a genotype, if we had whole genome sequencing of all, whatever, 6 billion people in the world and their electronic medical record, we would cure every disease in the world, okay? Uh, that, that's their view and that's what they're, they're doing because what when we come from nematode to mice and develop drug to humans, we fail very often. The experiments have all been done. And that's why Regeneron, um, NAFAR, and me and Tom Pearls are starting a project where we are recruiting the first extra 10,000 super centenarians around the world, because we know that their aging has been slowed significantly, and they have a mechanism that uh, we could work on. We have done it uh, before. So in fact, what you are saying is exactly what I wanted 20 years ago. And I, I recruited 750 centenarians and there are findings there, but to increase it by, logs, by log uh, square because they're holding the, the, the really the, the secret uh, for longevity. As far as, uh, and I'm, I'm doing everything that was mentioned, we have T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. We already have it, it's a service. You can, you can look at the Nathan Shock Center of my institute and you can get help. 
on biomarkers, on metabolomics, on proteomics, we're collecting all that. I wanna make just one point that is really important. If you're going to come and say, I want plasma of centenarians or something like that, remember that centenarians, on one hand, they achieve things thanks to their genome probably, whatever caused their slow aging. On the other hand, they're done now, you know, their end of their life, their, their, their chances of dying the next year is about 30%. And whatever you're measuring can either indicate what brought them here or predictive of, of, of their death that's coming in the next year. And that's why in this study, in my study, in Regeneron study, we're going to recruit their offspring because at least their offspring are far from death and they can actually have the best phenotypes. Our best phenotypes is when, when we compare offspring of centenarians and we have 1500 of those to 1500 people without longevity in their family. And then all of a sudden you see things like their IGF level, their HDL level, every, every, every and, and, and on proteomic. You see on proteomics that, and I showed it here before that that you get like 700 proteins between 65 and 95. But when you look at the offspring, they have only 20% of that because they're still, <laughs> they're still younger and they have special proteins that only they have and others don't have. So do, do the methylome clocks on the offspring of centenarians look better than the age match controls? We, we are doing it now. We did a whole uh, methylation assay that is less less informative as a clock. And they fall actually halfway between the centenarians and the control. Um, well, but centenarians are older. And the question is which methylation patterns are inherited? It is possible that the methylation pattern are inherited. So there's a lot of work to do on the biology of methylation and not only the clocks. And we're, we're doing the clocks now. I, I, I hope that's helpful, but that's a great question. We want, just like everybody for diabetes or for cancer or stuff, they're trying to find the genes. Yeah, this is very important. And the paper that I, I, uh, I attached in the box may, makes the point of it, how we go from genetic of centenarians to developing drugs, which is kind of what Lean talked about. Lovely. Any other comments or questions? All right, yes, well- okay. uh, is, I, I have a question for Nir. I want to know his opinion on it. So do you believe Nir that there is kind of a shared mechanism in all these super centenarians? Or do you also believe more that it's, they all have their own way of, of getting old and that is also kind of it, what's limiting us why we do not identify these shared mechanisms yet in the in the genetic studies that we did. So, so the, the answer is that what we're doing now with the help of all those people that Lim talked about, you know, the people who know to deal with computers and know how to, uh, you, you know, you know this this thing of uh, increasing the data is increasing the hay in a haystack to find a needle, right? So how can you do it? And one of the things we, are do we were doing is we were, we were putting all the genetic difference into pathways, okay? And it's the pathways that are really, really very telling, okay? The insulin IGF signaling pathway, mTOR signaling pathway, MPA kinase are really the major uh, pathways that distinct between those with longevity and those without. So I, I think it's all there. We just know, have to know what to ask and, and realize that, you know, uh, just one, one snip at a time means nothing. We are, we are made of very, very many snips on the time, uh, at a time and some will cancel each other. So we have, we have to do this extra work. I raised one point about what you were saying here. I think it's absolutely critical that we talk about the pathways. When we've been looking at some of our proteomics data, so many of the factors do not change in what would be deemed statistically a significant manner. But when you've got 50 proteins that are all involved in exactly the same biochemical pathway and they all shift in the same direction to just under that twofold cutoff, 
then the pathway becomes significant to like P is 10 to the minus 57 or something. Mm -hmm. and, and you just, you have to think in terms of the complex biology mm -hmm. rather than just thinking a biomarker is a protein, we will measure a level of a protein. It's all how these things talk to each other and interact that I think is a really crucial bit. So pathway analysis, I would say is, is, is key to all of this. So I'm glad you brought that up, thank you. All right, lovely. Thank you so, so much. Uh, we're now a few minutes over time, but I think uh, it was worth it, uh, that, uh, that little excursion at the end. Hey, uh, yours, and then thank you so much for uh, A, already contributing the challenges to the doc. Uh, thank you, Neil, for your comments. Um, thank you all for joining. Uh, it was really fantastic. We had a full house today. Um, and for those who, continue, who wanna continue talking, I'm gonna open up our gather space, our gather lounge. Uh, and in, in that you can just sit at uh, tables and decentralized chat to each other if you'd like. Um, and I will be seeing many of you uh, again very soon for Jean Hébert's uh, presentation. Uh, I think Jean may have already left, but that one is the next one up. Super excited for it. Uh, and we'll uh, be discussing specifically um, regeneration in the brain. So thank you very, very much for everyone uh, for joining. And um, thank you. And uh, I'll see you very soon, hopefully. Bye-bye.